Alright guys, this is over 8A. Uh, we're going to run through some of the definitions, terminology, and I'll make, help you guys make some connections. Um, first off, uh, at the beginning of the chapter, they're talking about um, a debate between hybrid vehicles, electric vehicles. Um, it, are, do they leave less of a footprint on the planet? Is it better to use things that um, use renewable energy sources? Um, and, and, and don't use fossil fuels. Well, it's important to kind of think of the pros and cons of that, right? Because, of course, the things that go into making, the things that go into making um, a hybrid vehicle, of course, you've got things like batteries, right? Mm -hmm. right you've got things that go into batteries. And, of course, batteries are going to require um, resources like lithium, right? Um, you have uh, lanthium. And, of course, you need the neodymium, um, neodymium magnets, right? You need neodymium magnets. Now, these things, you have to get them from the Earth, and this is kind of what we're going to be talking about with minerals. Um, minerals, and we're going to look at like things like rock cycles. So all these things kind of matter, right? And, of course, these things are not readily always renewable, right? The amount of elements we have in the soil are going to be cycled through um, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years worth of cycling. And, um, you know, why digging these things out of the ground, we're going to make, of course, holes in the ground. And holes have, like, their own ramifications, right? We can end up with um, fragmentation of the ecosystem, which is going to kind of, like, reduce the livable area that animals can live in. You're also going to have ground ground water pollution. You have ground pollution, and you can also get erosion, right? So these are some of the effects that we have from having cleaner vehicles. Is that we have to have the resources to build them, and that doesn't always, you know, that's not always like a free thing, right? So um, of course we are cutting down on CO two emissions by not having um, internal combustion engines. But it's something, it's something to kind of think about, right? Um, what I would do is I would definitely research kind of the, the effects of ecosystems based on the mining and kind of um, consider whether or not it's worth it, right? And, um, I, I, I do drive a hybrid vehicle. I think that it is, it is worth it, at least for my pocketbook. But, you know, those things that help us in the, in, on a personal level aren't necessarily always great on the global level, right? So it's something to kind of think about. Mineral resource and geology, the goal of this is to uh, describe the formation of earth and distribution of elements, look at plate tectonics, and its relevance in the study of environment, especially in terms of natural disasters, and to describe the rock cycle and discuss its importance on environmental science. Okay. The availability of earth's resources was determined when the planet was formed about 4.5 billion years ago. Um, Distribution of chemicals, minerals, and ores around the world is part of the function that occurred at the formation of the Earth. And a lot of these things happen based on the relative masses, okay? The relative masses of elements or materials with the heavier ones going to the bottom. The heavier sunk, right? And this has to do with, you know, gravitational pull, things like that. That's why you find nickel in the in the core and you find some of the lighter elements going towards the top right all right so formation of the earth about 4.5 4.6 billion years ago determined the distribution and abundance of elements and minerals today so it's important to note it's um this is one of my favorite quotes from astronomy is that we are all made of star stuff right Supernovae explode, they release elements out into the, into the cosmos, and those eventually cool and condense into accretion disks that form planets and solar systems. Um, so we're made up of the stuff that's already been in the universe. It's conservation of mass and matter. And everything that we have, for the most part, has been predetermined um, by the inception of our, of our planet. And we consider Earth, generally speaking, a closed system. Right, what we have is what we got. Now we do get a couple of, you know, a couple thousands of tons every so often from comets and meteor strikes that do hit the Earth, but they're not significant enough to, to um, to prolong any sort of mineral mineral depletion. All right, so we have this thing called zonation, 
Zonation is basically just like a vertical layering, vertical layering of all the layers of earth. So at the core, it's because nickel and iron, the heaviest ones, it's liquid on the outer and solid on the inner. This really has to do a lot with temperature and pressure. The mantle, which um, consists of almost the largest proportion, this right here is the largest proportion of the volume of the earth, it contains magma, right? So it's rock, but it is in liquid form and it's, it's moving. Okay, so that's magma molten rock there. The cenosphere is a layer of earth in the outer part of the mantle composed of semi-molten rock. So it's important to note that none of these regions really just stop like all together, right? So the asthenosphere is connecting both to the mantle and to the lithosphere, which we call the crust, right? Okay. So the crust is geologically, chemically distinct, and it is the outermost layer. It's very, very thin. We really haven't dug very deep in there. I believe uh, in the 40s and 50s, maybe, uh, Russia was trying to mine really, really deep down there. And it got hot very quickly, so they had to stop. I think maybe around 480 meters or so. Okay, formation, the structure of the Earth. These are Earth's layers. It's kind of just another picture of it. It's kind of interesting, right? So this would be the width of the Earth right here. And you know how many miles this is across. It's kind of, kind of tell you how thick the Earth is. Very kind of tough to get down there. And to think, we really haven't even gotten a considerable proportion of this region, right? We've never really gotten past here. And to think that you know, there's all this other stuff going on, right? It's crazy. Okay, hot spots. So here's what a hot spot is. It says if you were to have a spot in the mantle, it's nice and hot, and you were to have maybe some sort of land mass or, or plate that moves across, if I can get this right here. Moves over, and as it moves over, the hotness, the hot liquid lava, magma, spills up right here and makes volcanoes. Maybe, and as this cools off, it forms land masses. And this is actually what Hawaii did. It's worth noting that the um, heat we get from inside the Earth is leftover heat, and it's radioactive decay, various isotopes from that nickel. And this hot magma comes up from the heat inside from radioactive decay. Okay, theory of plate tectonics describes the movement of the lithosphere. So plate tectonics is for the lithosphere, the crust, right? And this was uh, by a German, German geologist, Wegener. Wegener, okay, Wegener. And he said that you were able to see um, similar fossils, or you were able to see similar fossils. So he saw similar fossils. And different types of rock formation, or the same types of rock formations across the ocean, right? So stuff you would see um, on one continent separated by the Atlantic Ocean or was, was similar to rock forms and fossils you'd see on land masses way, way across the ocean, right? So that was something that kind of signaled to him that there must have been a unified land mass way back in the day. A tectonic cycle is the process that break down the lithosphere. And this is how we recycle all of our minerals. The, um, is that we've learned about nutrient cycles, water cycle, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, um, phosphorus cycle, things like that. Um, what is worth noting about the mineral rock cycle that we're going to learn about right now is that it is incredibly slow compared to the others, right? It's very slow, slow, slow. So the rock cycle is slow. Okay, make sure you know. The kind of crazy thing about the rock cycle. Okay, so here are the plates right here, and this is called the ring of fire right here. Got that ring of fire. Okay, ring of fire. This is where all these plates are moving apart, moving together. Okay, so it's worth noting too is that in te plate tectonics, the plates are not just kind of stopping and going, creating earthquakes, creating volcanoes. Uh, we are in constant motion, and you grow about the, at the, these things move and, and hit each other about the rate that your fingernails grow, but over a very, very long period of time. Um, these things are working on geological time, um, and we don't really experience a lot of these things in our lifetimes. Right? Like, so continents moving apart, um, we don't experience appreciable differences, but um, there are times where we feel the, the sum of thousands of years of motion through earthquakes and tidal waves. 
All right, so all the motion of the lithosphere is from the convection, convective currents in the mantle here. So you have some spreading right here because look at the convection current. It's going up in this way, so it's going to push the lithosphere this way. And on the left-hand side, it's going counterclockwise, and at the top, it's going to push this, lith this uh, lithosphere to the opposite direction. So you get some seafloor, you get some spreading here. Now, since there isn't any continent here, we call this lithosphere, the crust here, we call this oceanic crust. And oceanic crust tends to be composed mostly of um, things that are high in iron, but a really large percent of basalt. This is basaltic crust right here. And when you make volcanoes out of basaltic crust, it's very slow, it's high viscosity. Right? So volcanoes like in Hawaii and stuff that are on that are on a oceanic crust here. They are going to have, when they do have volcanoes, they are not incredibly explosive, right? So the volcano is going to come out nice and slow, just like this. Awesome. Whereas if you were to look at somewhere maybe on the continent over here, right, when these guys form volcanoes, right? This is a lot more granitic. Um, granitic, so granite things that are much lighter, they're low viscosity low viscosity. So they're going to be very light. When these guys build up pressure, they explode, right? This is like Mount St. Helens, right? The volcano in Yellowstone National Park, of course, is on is a very granitic type of minerals. And when that thing goes off, which it is actually overdue to go off, um, it will be a very violent um, geological event. That's something to kind of watch out for. Um, the continental crust is typically going to slide over the oceanic crust, as you're seeing here. And that's because of the same reason that we had um, the zoning, the zoning of Earth's, Earth's layers. The lighter ones are going to stay on top, the heavier ones usually are going to subduce, right? So consequences of plate movement, you have subduction, passing under one another, a volcano, and it's worth noting um, that a lot of the CO2 in the atmosphere and oxygen in the atmosphere comes from right here, volcanoes, melting minerals out of rocks that are in stable positions uh, molecularly. They're going to go into um, the atmosphere when they melt and get, get emitted as, as gas, right? But, um, you know, people, people ask, like, well, uh, well, why are human beings' CO2 emissions really that big of a deal? Volcanoes are putting CO2 in the atmosphere. But... The CO2 that a volcano puts out, you know, we're trying to measure like man-made CO2 emissions versus natural volcanic CO2 emissions. The CO2 from a volcano has a different half-life than the CO2 emitted from um, vehicles, right? It's, it's very easy to measure and differentiate between the two. So it differs from man-made CO2. man's CO2, or women's CO2, right? equal rights, we saw the video, right? All right, so consequences of plate movement. So here's that hot spot thing I was talking about earlier. So the most recent island was this one. You can tell that because it's the largest one, right? Um, erosion from the ocean's waves, right? Erosion from the ocean's waves. We're going to kind of pull the rock off from here it's happening in Hawaii little by little, but um, as we slide down this way, as we slide over going this direction, there will eventually be a new landmass that will form here and grow, right? Because this hot spot right now currently is right under Hawaii. And so if we move this way, it makes sense that eventually, eventually this guy right here will slide over here and grow, right? This piece of water this way. Okay, so here's some uh, more vocabulary here, divergent plate boundary. Diverging means splitting, spreading apart, right? So that means the plates are splitting. It's going to give way for liquid hot magma to come up, you know, see full or spreading. Convergent plate boundaries when they meet and collide and transform fault boundary. This is important right here. The transform plate boundary is where you are going to have where you are going to have your volcanoes 
or at least your earthquakes, right? You're going to have your earthquakes here. Earthquakes and tsunami. Your earthquakes and tsunamis here. And this is when plates are slipping past each other. They slip past each other. And so here's a picture of that. And divergent plate boundary, convergent plate boundary, and transform fault. And you have like the normal slip which goes this way and you also have um, slip where it's an up and down where, they'll, where they're diverging and you'll have one plate kind of boop, push down. Right? All right, so here are some more things that have to do with plates contacting each other. A fault, you have seismic activity, and this is looking at the frequency of earthquakes over time. And I kind of want to talk a little bit about this, the seismic activity in fault zones. Um, we have this thing called the Richter scale, right? So on the Richter scale, um, it's important to know that it's logarithmic. Richter goes off of a logarithmic scale, which means powers of 10, which means the difference between a Richter scale 1 and a Richter scale of 2 is it not just 1, right? So since we're going up in powers of 10, so this would be 10 to the first power, 10 to the second power. We went to the fifth power. So if we look at the difference between a 2 and a 5, there's three separations, right? So what you would do is since there are 1, 2, 3, you would take 10 to the third, and that's 1,000 times greater, right? So that's how the Richter scale kind of works. And that can kind of tell you that if we're, we're considering that it takes a lot of pressure to get these plates to move past each other because they're jagged, right? That means you're going to build up, when they get stuck together, you're going to build up a whole lot of potential energy stored up in keeping the rocks where they're at. But as soon as they slip, which is very sudden, right? So remember that um, geological tectonic plates is always happening, but the difference between normal tectonic plates and, like a, and, a, and an earthquake is that the shift is very, very sudden. You're releasing all that potential energy very quickly, and this is going to create it's going to create a lot of vibrations. Not good vibrations, though, right? A lot of vibrations, a lot of damage, right? So that's kind of what's happening there. So if you consider that it takes all that pressure and stores up all that potential energy, you can see that something like a 2 might be very common, but like a 5, 6, 7 on the Richter scale, it's going to be very, very rare because look, think about how much more energy it's going to take because of how much more detrimental and powerful they are, right? All right, so here's some more earthquake facts. Same stuff we just talked about. If you want to pause the screen and kind of take notes on that. Okay, so here we go. Here's that ring of fire we were talking about earlier, ring of fire. These are long plate boundaries, which you need to know. We're almost done here. The rock cycle, we talked about this, is very slow, right? Very slow. And it, since it is the slowest of all Earth cycles, um, our minerals do not replenish very quickly. Um, so this is the ecologist's or the environmental scientist, rather, is very concerned about what happens at the lithosphere, right, in terms of the rock cycle. We don't really, um, environmental scientists aren't really looking at what's happening in the mantle and the core because it's outside the scope of human activity, right? But definitely looking at the lithosphere, looking at how we affect rocks that are on the surface, dirt on the surface, right? Because human activities do push and move around rocks and soil, right? So this is important. And if you can kind of start making connections to how this rock cycle, depending on what part of the planet you're on, can affect the K or carrying capacity of like a, of, an, of an ecosystem for humans, for animals, you know, this is going to matter, right? And not all these things happen um, because of human activity, right? Right now we are looking at stuff. We're looking at things that happens naturally as well. So uh, let's take a look at some of the natural things. So some of the natural things, right? So we just talked about earthquakes. Okay. 
These are things can, that can affect biodiversity. These are things that can affect human, human life and animal and plant life, right? Um, succession, obviously, right? If you completely take out um, some habitat by having it subduce over a long period of time, or an earthquake creates a landslide that gets rid of all the dirt and everything. Guess what we were looking at now? Now you go back all the way back to primary succession, right? Um, so that's how earthquakes are similar to some forms of human activity. But what's different about it is that it has nothing to do with us, right? That's the obvious difference. That happens, okay, so the rock cycle. Here's some different types of rocks here. You have igneous, which comes straight from molten rock, right? There are various types there. You do compression of sediments, that's sedimentary, and this is um, what tells us our time, right, through fossil records, right? And this is just laying layers and layers of, of soil and, and deposits based on, on chrono chronology, right? And exposure to high temperatures is metamorphic, and metamorphic could be either sedimentary or igneous. Right, and since it's a cycle, these can happen almost in any order. There's not like one set. Order. Okay, so here's how it works. There's a picture, there's a diagram of how this works. If you want to pause that and kind of take a look at it, there's igneous rock. Here's an example of that: granite or basalt. But you can take granite and make it into a metamorphic rock right here by just squeezing and putting pressure in it, looking kind of like this guy right here, right? So there's a little slide in your book that goes over some examples of this. Very nice. Okay, so igneous rocks, here's some specifics on that. Rock formed directly from magma. Intrusive igneous rocks. Igneous rocks that form when magma rises up and cools in a place underground. Extrusive is when it goes above earth. And a fracture is a crack that occurs in a rock as it cools. And sedimentary rock. And you have mud, sands, or gravels that are compressed by overlying sediments, and they can give us kind of a look back in the past. Right? Through fall. Metamorphic rocks, sedimentary, and sedimentary rocks, igneous rocks, or other metamorphic rocks have high temperature or pressure or both. And right? so you get some like your marble and things like that. There we go. Day. Alright, and that's